It's not a UFO, but it kind of looks like one. Today on Vintage Space, we are looking at the YB-49 Flying Wing. Like so many cutting edge aircraft, the YB-49 story begins with the Army Air Force. The Army Air Force, of course, being the Air Force under the US Army, because until 1947, it was not its own service branch. Just a little side note there. In 1941, just before the US formally entered the Second World War, the US Army Air Force initiated Project MX-140. The idea was to develop a long-range, high-altitude, heavy bombardment system. A contract was eventually awarded to Northrop Aviation, a relatively new player that was only created in 1930. But even though it was new, Northrop had some really cutting edge ideas that lent themselves very well to this long range heavy bombardment plane. Namely, because the company's founder, Jack Northrop, had a fondness for flying wings. He basically wanted to create an aircraft that was all wing, the idea being to minimize drag and maximize lift. If the aircraft was basically one giant wing, it would be able to fly much further distances than a traditional aircraft because there would be fewer surfaces like the pesky fuselage weighing it down through drag. The plane that emerged under this program was the XB-35. With a wingspan of 172 feet, the XB-35 promised to dwarf the wildly popular B-17 Flying Fortress. It boasted a new, electrically operated flight control system and also had a significant bombing capability. Eight bomb bays were built into the wing, allowing it to carry 10,000 pounds of conventional arms. And even though it was just a wing, there was still ample space for the crew. There was room on board for a pilot, a co-pilot, a radio operator, a navigator, a bombardier, and gunners. It also had room for six relief crewmen to sleep, a necessity given the design requirement of a 10,000 mile range on long duration flights. Unfortunately, the XB-35 just didn't develop on time, and in 1944, the Army Air Force opted to actually cancel the program. But the XB-35 was retained as a post-war aircraft, and there was a bit of a silver lining to this decision. One of the major technological breakthroughs of the Second World War was the invention of turbojet engines. With propeller planes facing extinction, the door was now open for a jet-powered version of the XB-35, and this became the YB-49. Rather than build entirely new aircraft, the YB-49 was actually just made by refitting XB-35s with new systems, including the jet engines. Also, two of the bomb bays in these retrofitted airplanes were turned into fuel tanks to feed those hungry jet engines. The YB-49 was not a perfect aircraft. It ended up with a shorter range than it was anticipated to have. It also had problems with the auxiliary power units that powered the electronic systems and demonstrated instability in flight, which basically made it useless as a bomb. But still, there were successes. One test flight of the YB-49 saw it aloft for nine and a half hours, six and a half of which were at an altitude above 40,000 feet. There was potential in the idea. But disaster struck the program on June 5th of 1948. A crew of five took the YB-49 aloft on its 25th test flight of the program. It moved through its flight plan, making position reports at regular intervals so crews on the ground could track the flight's progress. Then, 20 minutes after one check-in, Debris was found on the desert floor, and the main body of the aircraft was found shattered upside down. It looked like the aircraft had fallen out of the sky almost. There was very little indication of any horizontal velocity at the moment of impact. A debris field stretching three miles from the crash site revealed very little about what had actually gone wrong, but did say that a fire had destroyed most of the evidence. Ultimately, investigators were unable to say what brought down the YB-49, but some of the most compelling evidence pointed to overstressing. It's possible that the flying wing was ripped apart in flight due to overstressing from a high G maneuver, like pulling out of a dive. The YB-49's co-pilot that day had been Captain Glenn Edwards, and on December 5th of 1949, Murak Airfield was renamed Edwards Air Force Base in his honor. Incredibly, the crash that killed five pilots didn't actually kill the YB-49 program. It lasted until March 15th of 1950. On that day, the one remaining aircraft of the program was destroyed in a fire following a high-speed taxi incident. And the dream of the flying wing actually lives on. Northrop eventually built a flying wing aircraft, the B-2 Spirit Bomber, beginning in 1981, and there are still 20 in service with the US Air Force today. So what do you guys think about the concept of an all-wing aircraft? Because it looks pretty 
pretty interesting to me. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and any other questions you might have. And the story of Jack Northrup, the man who pioneered the idea of the flying wing and also founded the Northrop company that we know today as Northrop Grumman, led a fascinating life. I dug more into Northrop's story and the story of the flying wing in my latest blog post over on Vintage Space, so definitely check that out for way more details than I could bring up in this episode. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter as AST Vintage Space for daily Vintage Space content. And with new episodes going up right here twice a week, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode.